Hi there, I'm Myrtle aka Gatecat and I'm going to be giving this which is a, a basically a re-recording of a talk I gave in person at the FPGA Frontrunners event in Tamworth about my work at Chipflow building open source chips with Amaranth and a combination of other open source ASIC design tools. So to give a bit of background about myself, I'm the cat that developed and maintains NextPNDAR, which is an open source place and route tool for FPGAs, and it's focused on real designs for real FPGAs, and ease of use has always been a priority in my open source FPGA work. I've also done Project Trellis, which was open source bootstream documentation for the latter CCP5 FPGAs. Both these tools have multiple commercial users, and one of my interests now is bringing the innovation in these um, to uh, apply some of the same ideas to the worlds of ASIC chip design tooling. So at Chipflow, our, our, our goal is that any Python developer could be able to build chips. That's the kind of world we want to see. And the question is, how are we going to get there? So the key parts of our flow are Amaranth, which is an existing Python-based hardware description framework, combined with proven building blocks, and a kind of push-button backend toolchain with reliability a priority. What we want to build is something that can either produce a working chip first time, or if there's a problem, it will, it will fail early, it will give a clear failure that can be debugged, rather than producing something that doesn't work or needs lots of manual intervention. So to give a bit of an idea about how our flow is structured, um, we combine Amaranth, which is a, the Python-based hardware description framework, um, with IP cores both written in Amaranth um, in Python, and also third-party IP in Verilog or VHDL that can be wrapped in Amaranth, combined with SOC integration, which is what the user provides to connect these cores together with any custom logic they need. The synthesis part of the flow to go from um, this uh, RTL to Netlist uses Yosys, the open source FPGA synthesis tool that also supports ASIC. And for place and route, we use Coriolis, which is an ASIC place and route tool developed in France that uh, I'll talk a bit more about a bit later. Uh, finally, at the back ends of the flow, we have Tassiagol for static timing analysis transistor level and K layout and magic for design rule checking and uh, final verification. So Amaranth, which is probably the most important part of our flow, it's not about compiling Python to hardware, but using it to describe hardware. So it's very good for things like integrating SOC components. You can use Python's package management to manage IP cores. So you can just pip install a package and that gets you an IP core. And that even includes wrapping IP that contains existing Verilog VHDL files as well. And the bulk of the Amaranth development was done by White Quark Catherine. So this is a brief example of, of a small piece of Amaranth code. This is a very simple GPIO IP core. Um, we, we, we start by um, a, a very typical Python class with pins and bus as fields. And then the elaborate function is where the magic happens. This is where we're actually creating the hardware. So first of all, we set, set up an empty module. Then in the combinational part of the logic, we set the read data returned back onto the bus to be equal to the current state of the pins. Then if the write enable of the bus is active, then we set the current value of the pins to be um, the write data written out from the bus. So the next key part of our flow is Yosys, which is open source FPGA and ASIC synthesis. But it's not just that, it can be used for formal verification and other things as well. It has a Verilog front end. It um, supports uh, uh, code written in Amaranth via its um, intermediate language, which is what Amaranth produces, RTLIL. And finally, it can also um, synthesize VHDL using the GHDL-based front-end. Yosys HQ is the company behind Yosys. Uh, Yosys HQ also provides commercial support and a terrific uh, front-end for more language support uh, via the Yosys HQ uh, Tabby CAD suite. Coriolis is the place and route tool that we used. It's a VLSI place and route developed primarily by Lipsix in France. It's a very typical VLSI flow with all the parts. Um, it has a global placer, a detail placer, a global routing, and it does antenna fixing as well to prevent antenna violations. And then finally, detail routing. And one of the nice things about Coriolis in this flow is that uh, Coriolis is extendable and scriptable in Python. You're not writing uh, thousands of lines of tuckle if you want to do any kind of custom placement or, or override things. It can all be done in Python. And so this is perhaps useful where you need to mix general purpose place and route with some custom placement as well. 
For example, if you're making something like an embedded FPGA and you want a custom script to place the blocks or place the routing in a regular way. Uh, PDK Master is another part of our flow. PDK's uh, process design kits are, are a key part of any ASIC flow and they specify things like the design rules of the process, what kind of spacing rules you have, how wide your, your metal can be, um, how you build a transistor, all those kind of things. Uh, PDK Master is an open source Python framework for managing these PDKs. It has a, a, a scalable automatic cell library generator and it also generates the necessary technology files for Coriolis's place and route. Skywater 130 is the process we're targeting at the moment. It's a 130 nanometer CMOS process and it has an open source PDK um, with uh, no NDAs required. So usually in order to access the design rules that you need in order to build a chip, you um, have to sign a non-disclosure disclosure agreement and then, then you couldn't open source the work you've done because um, it's protected by that NDA. Uh, the other thing about Sky130 is it has um, multi-project wafer runs sponsored by Google for open source projects. So you're not spending the, the tens of thousands of dollars that you'd normally need for a tape out. You can have a go at building a chip for free. Uh, so our first tape out we did uh, using this flow was on uh, MPW3 back in October, November. This was a, a Minerva RISC-V CPU. Minerva is a, a RISC-V core written itself in Amaranth combined with um, SRAM, uh, just some simple RAM, Quad SPI Flash with Execute in place so it can run code directly off Flash, uh, external Hyper RAM support, uh, UART and GPIO. And this was using a very early work in progress port of, of, of Coriolis to the Sky 130 PDK. So this is an example of, of what the MPW3 SOC looked like. I'm not going to go through this in, in its full detail, but um, the key components is the Minerva CPU. Uh, the arbiter, which uh, combines the instruction and data bus into a, into a single shared bus, and then a decoder, which fans that bus out to the various peripherals. Uh, and those peripherals are the uh, memory mapped quad SPI flash, uh, the SRAM, the static RAM, the external hyper RAM interface, the GPIO, uh, asynchronous serial for the UART, and a timer. And both the serial and the timer can produce interrupts that go into the interrupt controller. And uh, on the left is the uh, code that went into that SOC um, uh, to glue all those components together. So you can see uh, we can build a whole sort of small microcontroller class SOC in, in roughly a page of code. And this is, this is what the chip looked like. So you can see um, with the work in progress PDK, the cells we were using were, were fairly conservatively sized. So this SOC pretty much filled the 10 millimeter squared that we'd been given. MPW4 um, used the same SOC as MPW3, but um, for this we were focusing on uh, improving the PDK and fixing the density violation that unfortunately meant MPW3 didn't get taped out, and generally improving the flow to increase its reliability and, and it get something closer to production ready. So the MPW4 SOC, this was the same SOC, but uh, now you can see with the improvements we made, it's uh, fitting into much, much smaller area. MPW5, uh, with the improvements we had in MPW4, we decided to aim for something a bit more ambitious. So we went for uh, a Linux-capable SSC, at least in theory. It's not going to run anything that quickly, but it uh, should at least boot Linux and run simple command line stuff. This time we switched from Minerva to the Vextris 5 CPU, which is written in Spinal HDL. Spinal HDL is another new hardware description framework that generates Verilog and that Verilog can be integrated into, into Amaranth in, um, in the way that was described earlier, so pack packaged up and then wrapped. Uh, this is a, a more complex CPU, so we have instruction and data caches and also an MMU, which is a memory management unit important to run full Linux. Uh, again, we use the same uh, execute in place quad SPI flash arrangement. Um, we just have the setup so the Linux kernel itself doesn't need to be loaded into memory it can stay resident in flash. And we rewrote the HyperAM controller to be much higher performance um, in order to speed up the boot time a bit. So MPW5 also was the first time that we started doing some serious simulation tests as well. We set up a debug environment uh, using CXXRTL. This is a feature of Yosys that compiles RTL down to um, compilable C++ for simulation. Um, so you can then build the C++ model of the SOC 
and also write peripheral models and bus monitors in C++. So we could do things like, uh, as Linux was booting, trace every memory read and write the CPU was doing, along with the current program counter of the CPU. And this was really useful for debugging some issues we hit with execute in place support on 32-bit RISC-V systems. So uh, this is what MPW5 looked like. Uh, even with the new PDK, this is uh, using quite a bit bigger area because of the larger amount of memory and um, in general the more complex um, SOC. So to get an idea of uh, what kind of code has gone into a Linux capable SOC using our framework, um, I'm going to go through the different bits of that MPW5 SOC now. So um, to start with, uh, we import all the IP we need. Um, as mentioned, IP imports use Python packages. Um, so we import the, the base SOC wrapper, um, the wishbone bus, the Vextrus 5 CPU, and then the peripherals we're adding to this SOC are GPIO, the XIP quad spy flash, the UART, the hyper RAM, a basic platform timer, and an ID core that lets us find out um, what the SSC is and when it was built. So uh, then we start with the Python class defining the SSC and we add some constants for the memory map of the SSC. So we have the um, spy and the hyper RAM uh, memory, memory devices at uh, the beginning of memory, and then we have the uh, peripheral devices that aren't. Um, providing memory reasons but just controlled registers at uh, starting at 0xb in high memory. And the uh, devices that with control memory are the quad spy controller, a GPIO for some LEDs, UART timer, um, SSCID, hyper RAM control um, for setting up the memory, and we also have a constant for whether we're building this in a, in a large configuration or not. Once we've done that, we start setting up the CPU um, and the arbiter which combines the instruction and data bus of the CPU once again into a single bus. And we also um, have support for two different CPU configurations, uh, depending on whether we want the large one with a bit more cache or not. Then once we've done that, we add the two memory devices, the ROM, which is the memory map quad spy flash, and that has both a data bus, which is accessing the flash itself, and a control bus, which is for um, setting up the controller and doing any extra SPI configuration of the flash. And it's similar with the Hyper RAM. It has its memory mapped region and also some control interfaces for configuring things like the um, latency and control registers of the memory. Then we have our SSC peripherals. We have a GPIO, which is added to the bus, a UART, which we set a default divisor for and add it to the bus, a platform timer for generating the timer interrupts Linux needs, and finally, the SOC ID core, which um, lets the software know if it's running in simulation or not. And it also embeds the git commit hash of the repository used to build the SOC. So you can see which code it was built from. Then we add all the IP cores that we've added as fields as submodules. And we then just do some uh, simple wiring as combinational logic. We connect the um, output of the arbiter to the input of the decoder. So um, this connects those two buses together. Um, we're not using any software interrupts, so we set that to a constant zero and we connect the timer interrupt output of the platform timer to the um, CPU timer. Then we have a bit more connectivity. Um, JTAG is only used in the silicon tape app, not in FPGA, so we connect that up if, if we're uh, building, building for silicon. Uh, likewise, in, only in simulation do we need the wishbone bus monitor, so we um, Add that as a, add that as an extra extra feature if we're running in running in simulation. Finally, we um, have a software generator which is uh, what generates header files and linker scripts based on those constants we set up earlier for the peripheral addresses, and this can be used to um, build the simple BIOS bootloader, which is what what ultimately jumps into the Linux kernel. So that's um, that's where we were for uh, our current status, and the repository for the code is at that link. Um, the next steps that we are looking at is going to be extending this library of IP cores so we can build more different kinds of SOCs with more different kinds of um, IP. And then on the place and root side, we want to support um, routability driven placement so that as we get into larger, more complex SOCs, we aren't accidentally producing placements that are very difficult to root.
Longer term, we're interested in supporting processes smaller than 130 nanometers and also analog and mixed signal IP blocks.